The second of the two modern and deadly Bismarck-class battleships, the Tirpitz, emerges from the Kiel Canal in January 1942 and heads north to her new berth in the Fjord in Norway. The war on the Eastern Front has been raging for seven months, and Britain is sending supply convoys to the Soviet Union. Because of the harsh Arctic conditions, the convoys have to sail dangerously close to German-occupied Norway. If given unchallenged access to these waters, Tirpitz could make light work of the lightly escorted convoys, cutting the supply of vital war material for the Soviet Union that is fighting a brutal war of attrition in the east. Churchill orders the bombing of Tirpitz in Norway to commence immediately. The first attempt is made by Bomber Command in late January. Seven Stirlings and nine Halifaxes loaded with 2,000 pound and 500 pound bombs make the 600 mile trip from RAF Lossiemouth in Scotland. Some have to turn back with fuel concerns, and of those that continue, no hits are scored. In March, Vice Admiral Otto Celiax, who has successfully executed the channel dash of battleships Scharnhorst and Gneisenau the month before, takes command of Tirpitz and her battle group. He's alerted to two convoys in the Norwegian Sea, and Tirpitz leaves the field with three destroyers. He knows that the Royal Navy's home fleet will be nearby to cover the convoys, and should be avoided at all cost. Little does he know, the codebreakers at Bletchley Park have alerted the British Admiral Tovey that Tirpitz is moving to attack the convoys. One of the destroyers finds and sinks the straggling Russian freighter Izora from convoy QP-8, returning empty from the Soviet Union to Britain. Celiax realises that finding QP-8 means that he's missed the more valuable fully laden convoy PQ-12 en route to Murmansk, calls off the sortie and turns back towards Norway. Citing British ferry Albacore carrier aircraft shadowing him, Celiax knows the British fleet must be nearby and changes course to evade. It doesn't work, and 12 further Albacores locate and attack the battleship with torpedoes from her port and starboard beam almost simultaneously. All torpedoes miss. Tirpitz escapes to Bergenfjord before returning to Fjord three days later. In March and April, Bomber Command would make three further attempts to hit Tirpitz in the fjords using Halifax's and the new Lancaster heavy bomber, dropping 4,000 pound bombs known as cookies. While infrastructure and the cruiser Admiral Scheer take hits, Tirpitz remains undamaged. 12% of the aircrew involved in the air attacks are killed. While the earlier Albacore torpedo attack on Tirpitz was a failure, it was a close call for the Kriegsmarine. The Fuhrer orders that no further sortie should be attempted if British carriers are operating in the Norwegian Sea. This doesn't mean that she isn't a continuing problem for the Allied war effort. The naval doctrine known as Fleet in Being is a strategy whereby a fleet or ship avoids decisive engagement with a superior enemy fleet in the open sea but remain safely in port near to the area of strategic importance. The threat that Tirpitz might sortie into the Norwegian Sea to attack convoys ties down the powerful Royal Navy assets to the region to make sure that she doesn't. These are assets that are desperately needed in the battles of the Atlantic, Mediterranean and in the Far East to counter the powerful Japanese Navy. No further major raids are conducted in 1942 and in early 1943, Tirpitz moves up to the Kofjord in the far north of Norway. Out of range for the heaviest hitting Lancaster, and with the lighter but longer range American B-17s engaged in the bomber offensive against Germany, she is for the time being spared from heavy air attack. 1943 would end in disaster for the Kriegsmarine, however. In September, two British midget submarines managed to infiltrate the Kofjord and lay mines underneath Tirpitz. The resulting explosions cause major flooding and jam her forward turrets. Tirpitz is put out of action for the winter while repairs are carried out. In December, the battleship Scharnhorst sorties from the same field to attack Arctic convoy JW55A and is sunk at the Battle of North Cape. The next major attack comes from the fleet air arm in April 1944, Operation Tungsten. Force 7, made up of six carriers, Two cruisers, including HMS Belfast, and six destroyers position themselves 124 miles northwest of Tirpitz. They've been joined by a further battleship, cruiser, and six destroyers. At 4:16 a.m., an enormous air wing of 169 aircraft begins to launch from the carriers in two waves. 
40 Fairy Barracuda dive bombers will attack Tirpitz with 1,600 pound armor piercing and 500 pound general purpose bombs. 40 Wildcat and 20 Hellcat fighters provide close protection to the bombers on the route in, while 21 Corsair fighters provide higher altitude overwatch. A further 18 Seafire and 8 Wildcat fighters and 12 Swordfish anti-submarine aircraft are launched to protect the fleet. The crew have carefully studied models of the field, Turpitz's predicted position and flak positions. Approaching the field, the bombers rearrange into a single line astern. Flying over the final ridge into the field, the first wave discovers Turpitz exactly where predicted and begin their dive bombing runs. Defensive flak opens up on them and the Hellcats and Wildcats dive to low level to shoot up the enemy flak positions. The whole first wave attack lasts one minute. Turpitz has sustained many armor-piercing and general-purpose bomb hits, and her deck is burning when the second wave arrives. Again, the fighters dive down to strafe anti-aircraft batteries, and the Barracudas deliver another fearsome attack from above. Over the two waves, the attacking crews claim 14 bomb hits on the ship, causing multiple strong fires and flooding. 122 German crewmen are killed. The Royal Navy triumphantly declare that Tirpitz is now an unusable ship, but they're wrong. While the accuracy of the bombing was impressive, the damage to Tirpitz is largely superficial. The armor-piercing bombs have not penetrated her armored citadel. Photo recon flights confirm that Tirpitz is still operational. Between April and August 1944, the Royal Navy makes several attempts at Barracuda attacks again. Operations Planet, Brawn, Tiger Claw and Mascot are either cancelled or fail due to weather or a smokescreen obscure target on arrival. In July, after repairs, Tirpitz is able to slip moorings for a short sail within the fields. Fearing that she'll be ready to attack the next convoys in August, the British Admiralty decide to launch a sustained operation against her, conducting bombing operations until the job is done. This sustained attack will be Operation Goodwood. The home fleet dispatched three fleet carriers, two escort carriers, a battleship, and 29 screen ships to rendezvous near Cofield. On the 22nd of August, Goodwood Mission 1 is attempted but aborted for dense cloud over the target. A smaller nuisance attack, Goodwood 2, is executed later in the evening with just six Hellcats and eight Fireflies, with no bomb hits. Meanwhile, the escort carrier Nabob is attacked by a U-boat while refueling away from the main force, and has to limp back to Scarpa Flow. On the 24th of August, Goodwood 3 finally proceeds with good weather. Similar to the earlier Tungsten mission, 33 dive-bombing Barracudas launch, each with a 1,600-pound armor-piercing bomb. Most of the 24 Corsairs provide close escort, with five also carrying bombs. Ten Hellcats will help attack the ship and also attack the ground-based anti-aircraft batteries in the fields. Ten Fireflies provide top cover, and eight Seafires move to shoot up the nearby Banak airfield. This time, the force is spotted on radar as it approaches the Norwegian coast, and the AA batteries and smokescreen generators mobilize. By the time the formation arrives, Tirpitz is surrounded by smoke and a strong box barrage of flak. The Corsairs dive and strafe the flak positions. The Hellcats are the first to bomb the ship, scoring a single hit. The five bomb-armed Corsairs are next. Three of the five are shot down, and a fourth later ditches in the sea. They score no hits. This time, the Barracuda crews can't see through the dense smoke, and aim at the tracer fire flashing up at them. All bombs miss because of the blind aiming, except one 1,600-pound bomb, which penetrates through five decks on Tirpitz's port side. It fails to explode. The fleet air arm attempt a nearly identical Goodwood 4 six days later. Again, smoke shrouds Tirpitz and no hits are scored. Ultra signal intercepts reveal that the massive effort by the Royal Navy has resulted in negligible damage. It becomes clear that sinking Tirpitz will require a bigger bomb. RAF Bomber Command stand up to the task. 617 Squadron, the Dambusters, and 9 Squadron, Avro Lancasters, fly from their bases in Lincolnshire to Lossiemouth. 
From there, they transit across Norway and Sweden to Jagodnik airfield in the Soviet Union. They carry with them a new bomb, the Tall Boy. Weighing 12,000 pounds and encased in hardened steel, the Tall Boy breaks the sound barrier at terminal velocity and penetrates 16 feet of concrete. The detonation produces a small earthquake, hence the nickname the Earthquake Bomb. The 12,000 pound bomb in comparison with the 1,600 pound bomb dropped by the Barracudas is thought to be the weapon to take out Tirpitz. On the 15th of September 1944, 27 Lancasters armed with 20 tall boys and some smaller mine bombs launched their attack with a Mosquito and a further Lancaster that will film the raid. The mission is called Operation Paravane. They fly low over Finland to avoid the German radar station at Kirkenes. Over Lapland, they split into two forces, Force A armed with tall boys, Force B with mine bombs. Unfortunately, they're still spotted, and arrive to find Tirpitz shrouded by smoke. Force A drop their tall boys into the smoke, at where they think the battleship is. A single bomb hits her, penetrating the armoured deck and the hull below. The massive detonation blows a huge hole in her side. One Norwegian local describes the hole as large enough to sail a small boat into. The shock of the explosion has damaged the ship's engines and turbines. German signal intercepts by Bletchley Park reveal the severity of the damage caused. Tirpitz is declared unseaworthy and slowly moves southwest near Tromso. There she will remain as a gun battery to deter an Allied invasion of Norway. Her flak and smokescreen equipment is being dismantled and transported south to her new berth, but all won't become fully operational for several weeks. With modifications to the Lancaster's fuel tanks and engines, and with the removal of its top turret, Tirpitz is now just within range of Lancaster attack from Scotland. And so, from bases in northern Scotland, Operation Obviate takes place on the 29th of October 1944. 39 Lancasters armed with tall boys arrive above Tirpitz. Group Captain Willie Tate, commander of 617 Squadron, circles the area and directs the attack. This time, Cloud obscures the target. The flak is heavier than anticipated because unknown local flak batteries have been rapidly deployed. A total of 32 tall boys are aimed at the mighty ship, but no hits are scored. The aircraft withdraw back to Scotland. On the 12th of November, Operation Catechism brings 29 Lancasters of 617 and 9 Squadron over a relatively cloudless sky above the enemy ship with another aircraft filming the attack. 617 attack first. Tate scores a direct hit which produces a large mushroom cloud. The plan is nearly identical to the earlier Operation Obviate. It takes just 8 minutes for all aircraft to drop their bombs. Tirpitz takes two direct hits although one does not explode. Several further tall boys explode nearby and the concussion shocks damage the hull, causing massive flooding. The Lancasters return to base. Tirpitz floods uncontrollably. Unknown to her captain, large craters have been blown into the seabed under the ship. The seabed is much deeper than he realises, so he does not abandon ship, believing that the ship's hull will settle on the floor just a few metres below her keel. The mighty Tirpitz suddenly rolls over, trapping 1,000 crewmen inside. Of these, only 84 men survive. The remains of her hull lie there to this day. She serves as a reminder that the days of battleship supremacy and war on the seas ended in the Second World War, and that land and carrier-based air power are the dominant force in modern naval warfare. Norway is liberated in 1945.